Jason Vines. He's 56 years old. We'll let everybody know that because he raised his hand anyway when we asked for under 65s. <laughs> He's an independent communications consultant and author. In 2014, he released his first book, What Did Jesus Drive? Crisis PR in Cars, Computers, and Christianity. Vines followed that with a hilarious compilation of his satirical posts on the Detroit News political website in Jimmy Hoffa Called My Mom a Bitch. <laughs> Profiles in Stupidity. That was in 2015. Served as a top communications professional for three automakers, Nissan, Ford, and also Chrysler Group between 1998 and 2007. He was named top PR professional in the automotive industry in 99, 2005, and 2006 by Automotive News. He is credited with leading some of the most memorable product launches in the automotive industry, including the Chrysler 300, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, Dodge Viper, and the reborn Nissan 350Z. Vines also was the communications chief during some of the biggest crises in automotive history, including claims of sudden, unintended acceleration in Jeep vehicles, kids getting killed by front seat airbags, Nissan Motor Corp on the brink of bankruptcy, and perhaps the granddaddy of all, the Ford Firestone tire crisis in 2000 and 2001. Vines is Director Emer Emeritus of the Automotive Hall of Fame, an organization he served as chairman for two years, and one he hopes to be inducted into someday. <laughs> but he's not holding his breath. Well, actually he is, because basically you have to be dead to get inducted. <laughs> Vines received a master's degree in labor and industrial relations from Michigan State University in 1984 uh, with a double major in economics and communications theater from Central College in Pella, Iowa in 1982. He's been married to his wife Betsy for more than 29 years, has three college graduates that thankfully are employed and have their own health insurance, by the way, their own cell phone contracts and auto insurance policies. Wow. They live in Wilmington, North Carolina and Lewiston, Michigan. Yes, like the Clintons, they have more than one home, despite earlier being dead broke. Oh, sorry about the political comment. Joseph Joe Cappy. Joe is not 56. <laughs> he is 82. He was the last president and chief executive officer of American Motors before the company was acquired by Chrysler Corp in 1987. After graduating from the University of Wisconsin with degrees in accounting and marketing, he began his automotive career with Ford Motor Company, first serving as an accountant in the infamous Edsel division. Over the next 26 years, Cappy would serve in a variety of management functions at Ford, culminating in his appointment as general, managing, general marketing manager of the Lincoln Mercury division. In 1982, the country's smallest major automaker, American Motors, wooed Cappy away from Ford and named him vice president of the marketing group. After accepting increasing levels of responsibility over the next few years and joining the board of directors, he was appointed as president and CEO four short years after joining AMC. Under his leadership, American Motors changed the entire automotive landscape with the introduction of the 1984 Jeep Cherokee, a compact, SUV that took the market by storm. He also oversaw the development and launch of what most consider the quintessential Jeep, the Wrangler, a descendant of original World War II military Jeep. Upon Chrysler's acquisition of American Motors on August 7, 1987, Cappy was named Vice President of the newly formed Jeep Eagle Division. He was later named Vice President in Brand Development then Vice President of International Operations, and finally Vice President of Chrysler Technologies and Rental Car Operations, with the responsibility to spin off those operations considered non-core. In 1998, Cappy was appointed CEO, Director, and President of Dollar Thrift, Thrifty Group, where he spun dollar rent a car and thrifty car rental from Chrysler in a successful IPO, placed the merged companies as a newly independent company on the New York Stock Exchange. Joe lives with his wife, wife Patty in their homes in Harbor Springs, Michigan and Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we want to thank him for this. He served his country as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserves and retired as a captain. Thank you for your service, Joe.
Before I bring the two of them up, all I would say is, is the NCRO group needs, group needs to find somebody with smaller biographies, because this is... <laughs> anyway, I want you to welcome um, Jason and Joe. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dave. Um, it is a pleasure to be back here. Um, once again, I get to feel younger today because uh, I get to be... Can't hear me? Hear me now? I got the lav on. Is it working now? Better? Better? Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, and I get to feel young again because I get to be Joe Cappy's PR guy again. You still can't hear? Let's just use this mic. As I said, I get to be uh, Joe Cappy's PR guy again. Uh, I got into PR accidentally. I was actually being groomed to go into marketing to work for Ralph Cerati. I had been uh, Joe's uh, speechwriter for a few months, and I started working with Ralph, and when we were working on the Eagle Division, one of the great success stories in the history of Chrysler. <laughs> and the Friday before the Monday I was to join the marketing organization, I got a call from Steve Harris, who was the head of PR. Actually, I think he was number two at that time. Baron Bates was the head. And Steve, I'm, I'm at home working on the lawn on a Friday, and he goes, uh, hey, Jason, uh, Joe Cappy just called me, and uh, we just fired the Eagle PR guy, and Joe's wondering if you can go into PR instead of marketing. And I said, what's the difference? <laughs> I soon learned. However, it, uh, it started my PR career, for better or worse. And then another person that's in the audience that I brought along, my brother-in-law, Chris Theodore, had Jack Nasser hire me at Ford Motor Company as the head of PR. And a week after I started, the Firestone tire crisis started. So thank you very much, Chris Theodore. <laughs> If you want to know anything about tires, I know everything there is to know about tires. But uh, I learned a lot along the way, and, um, and this gave me a chance, and I'm going to tell you the story of how this book came together. How many people have already got a copy of this? Okay. Well, you'll know, first of all, that Joe Cappy is not his real name. It's Joe Capizzi. <laughs> but, like is all important in today's world, I have found decades-old videotape of Joe Cappy. Now, i got to warn you, it's graphic in nature. It's huge. So let's roll a videotape of Joe Cappy. Just a second. Got sound? Any sound? That's the best you've ever sounded.
Please, I mean, if they ever start pointing at me in the street and calling me a Jeep, I'll be glad to return that salute any time because Jeep is a name and a product and a heritage that anybody would be proud of. Now, like the Statue of Liberty, it's a symbol of a lot of things that you people here in this room stand for. And you should be proud because you have kept it alive. Think of it. But I think Jeep also stands for a lot of things that Chrysler has tried to keep alive in the past 10 years, too. And we've been serving more than a challenge, almost a duty, to see the Jeep heritage grow and become even more distinguished now that it's part of Chrysler. You've got my commitment tonight that Jeep Eagle is now a full fledged and equal part of Chrysler Motors along with our other two franchises. And we're going to do whatever it takes to build on that. As salespersons, you have unique vehicles that take a back seat to no one, which brings up another bit of fiction about Jeep. That is, the Jeep is so good, it sells itself. The fact is that Jeep is so good, it almost sells itself. <laughs> As professionals, you know that it takes product knowledge and selling skills to bring the Jeep story to your customers. We feel the information contained in this presentation will help you learn more about Jeep vehicles, and therefore help you assure your prospects that Jeep is a wise choice. They can expect the best. Thank you, and good selling. Cool. Um, yeah. So in, in December of 2014, a month after my first book came out, What Did Jesus Drive? I get a call out of the blue from Joe Cappy. He goes, hey, I just read your book. I loved it. I said, thanks. He goes, you inspired me to write a book. I said, well, good for you. He goes, can you help me? And I said, sure. So last summer, I, uh, I drove over to his house with with that with he and patty um and in harbor springs uh we played golf and uh and then we sat on his porch and we had some beer and wine and he started telling the stories he had already outlined the book he had i think he had 12 15 chapters but then i spent i think three hours talking to him because i thought i knew joe but i didn't i didn't know about the special project at Ford Motor Company, the E-Project, the Edsel, that he had involvement in the world's worst car in the history of mankind. <laughs> I didn't know that he was from Wisconsin and um, that he'd been in the, the Army. Um, so I got to know all of this, these stories. And so I left after two days, went back to my place at Garland, and for the next month and a half started taking what he had given me and made it into a book. And when I was done, I sent it to him, I emailed it to him. 24 hours later, Joe calls me and goes, I read the book. I go, how in the world did you read the book? Did you stay up all night? He goes, yeah. I go, you're 82 years old. <laughs> you don't stay up all night. I said, well, what do you think? He goes, I gave you a textbook and you turned it into a novel. I go, are you okay with that? He goes, I love it. It also happens to be true. And so that's how this came to be the last American CEO. Uh, I'm really proud of this book for both of us because, uh, it, again, it all happens to be true. But it does read somewhat like a spy thriller because Renault had pulled away from negotiating with Chrysler for the sale of American Motors. Uh, the chairman didn't want to, of Renault did not want to sell the company because he needed a foothold. And just a few weeks after the talks had stopped, George's Bess had, was chauffeured every day from Renault headquarters to his home in Paris. And his daughter would look out the window and wait for him to arrive in his chauffeur-driven vehicle. And on that particular day, he got out and got out on the sidewalk heading towards his front door. And two women were pushing a baby buggy down the sidewalk. And as they got closer to him, they reached in and pulled out guns and shot him in the chest and then stood over him and shot him in the head and killed him. It was a mafia-style hit, but it was from the Red Faction, an anarchist uh, terrorist group that uh, was going around Europe. Well, a few weeks or months later, I think weeks, the talks were back on, led by uh, Steve Miller, Ben Bidwell, at Iacocca's request. Uh, and we'll talk when I get into the Q&A with, with Joe about uh, how that came to be and how Jeep primarily came into the Chrysler fold and in, in, in my opinion in the book saved Chrysler three times. Um, 
and today. So yeah, it is to me the most iconic brand in, in the auto industry, and it will always will be. And, and a lot of that is due to Joe Cappy. Um, and so what I would like to do at this moment is bring up my friend, the guy that got me in this crazy business, and a, a mentor, and one of the best human beings I've ever known, Joe Capizzi. <laughs> Thank you, and I got to tell you, I'm delighted <clears throat> to be here with this group of people who really were the ones that were the fighters that brought Chrysler through so many tough times. And I want to congratulate you all. <clears throat> now, Jason gave you his version of, <laughs> of how he got this job in PR, and uh, well, there's a, a little, so little different when you hear it from me, and I'm the one that had to make the decision. You see, I had heard that Jason on weekends was going to the Comedy Castle and doing, you know, when it opened mic night, he'd get up there and he'd tell these jokes that he thought were very funny. And I said, you know, I need some, some, you know, some joy in my life after what I had been through with this uh, Renault Chrysler secret deal. And plus he could put some fun in some of my speeches. Well, the one time he tried, he claims that I screwed up the punchline, but I just think it wasn't funny, that's all. <laughs> And, and you know, is it, what, what did I see in this young guy? Well, he, he wasn't like a typical marketing guy. You know, the marketing guys, they exaggerate everything. <laughs> you know, and, and they, they're the ones who uh, smoke the reefers and drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. I wanted somebody who had what I call the PR stuff, and that is to be always truthful, to always protect the customer, and be willing to take, be the messenger to bring the boss the bad news, and to take the bullet if he needed to. And that's what I saw in Jason, and uh, I figured he'd be terrific in PR. Little did I know that he'd end up being the PR head at three different auto companies. I mean, that is fantastic. Great. <laughs> and with that, uh, Jason, uh, I don't know if you want to, uh, you know, those of you that read the book will know some of this, uh, and I'll just try to, uh, you know, amplify these questions to kind of help those that haven't had a chance yet. So I, I, I put together a, a few questions, and I'm going to let Joe answer. The first one is, uh, so you were a whiz kid accountant at Ford in the late 50s. We've already said it, but let's further expound it. What was the e-project you were assigned to, and how did that end? Well, he's got to bring up the old crap, okay, the Etsy. Well, I was working uh, in a accounting at the time, and I was going into the service for my uh, active duty, and I hadn't seen the car, and but there had been a tremendous amount of PR material and marketing material that had gone out. So I asked, I said, before I go in, you know, they weren't going to uh, show anyone pictures of the car for another six months, I said, I'd like to see what the car looks like. And uh, so I asked my boss, I said, could I see the car? And so they made arrangements. And I was brought down to an office of a product planner. And they, 
the product planner brought, ushered us into his, his inner office, closed and locked the door, went over to a large safe, opened it and pulled out a book about this thick. And it was filled with photographs. And he sat me at the desk at a table with the book in front of me and wouldn't let me open the book. He, he went on and started telling me all of the things that were so great about the, the car that became the Etzel. And I listened to all of this, and then he opened the book. And staring at me face on was the grill. <laughs> now, what do you think you're supposed to say after this kind of a, you know, madam, your baby looks like a monkey? <laughs> So I said, wow. <laughs> and then I proceeded into the Army, and of course, they did the, the launch without me, which wasn't too much of a problem, because it wasn't too much of a launch. But uh, it didn't quite turn out well. And uh, that led me over to uh, eventually, when they consolidated uh, the Etzel division into Lincoln and Mercury, and they called it MEL. Okay, so now let's fast forward a few years, and you're the new CEO of American Motors. And just within a couple weeks, your CFO, John Turney, comes to you and tells you what? Well, John came to me and he said, Joe, and, and literally this is just probably less than a week, after I took over, and he said, uh, we're gonna run out of cash by the end of the year. <laughs> and I said, well, how much cash? He said, about, we need about 200 million. And I said, well, you know, we've been, this company has been losing hundreds of millions of dollars every year for the last several years. I said, uh, can't you do something about it? And uh, can we borrow it? He said, well, we'll go try. He's back in a couple of days, and he said, no one, no bank will lend us any money. Well, okay, why don't we try to get some money from junk bonds, as Michael Milken and Drexel Burnham were burning up, you know, financing all kinds of stuff. So he went and he talked to, uh, to Drexel, and they set up a meeting for me in Los Angeles. And two people from Drexel were coming in from New York to accompany me to LA. Now this is really kind of an interesting thing because the meeting was going to take place at 4 a.m. in the morning. Los Angeles time. They wanted to be finished with it before the stock exchange opened in New York, which at that time was it's not like it is now. I think it was <clears throat> 9.30 or thereabouts. Anyway, the uh, two fellas met me in the lobby at, uh, at 3.30 in the morning, and we didn't get in until we you know, probably 11, 12 o'clock that night, and we had our luggage, and Drexel, Mike Milken's office was a short way away, and so we were walking with our luggage uh, out of the hotel when a, uh, a now remember, is, this is like 3.30 in the morning, uh, a Jeep pulled in, and it was one of those Jeeps that had been outfitted in, in gold, gold wheels, gold stripes, and that. And this very attractive lady jumped out, and a guy jumped out, and he ran over, and he gave her a big smooch. And these guys said, did you set this up? I said, no, I had nothing to do with that. Well, we walked down to Milken's office, and uh, sure enough, at 4 o'clock, he walked in, and he said, tell me your story. I talked for a half hour, and then Milken 
talk the rest of the time until all the phone banks lit up. And what he said is 200 million, he says, I can get you 500 million. I said, well, okay, this is great. So he said he would do it. And then before I left, he asked us if he wanted to see where uh, he operates from. And there was a bullpen and the desks were kind of in uh, circles all the way around them. And he was in the center and he had uh, a phone in each hand. He had one phone under his, his arm. Uh, the guys around them all had phones and they were trying to you know, motion to him. It was, it was an unbelievable, you know, wild scene. So I was awfully glad to get out of there. Well, a week later, I said uh, to my CFO, I said, well, have we got the, the cash yet? He said, uh, no, we haven't. Uh, they're having a little tougher time than they thought. Well, a week later, where are we? Well, we haven't got it yet. It's, it's you know, I guess they think we're a little weaker than we think we are. And I finally, you know, hit the roof. I said, you know, he said, if we need 500, he'd, he'd get it for us. We're only asking for 200. And I, I uh, called up the guy who had accompanied me from Drexel in New York, and I said, your hot shot is not a hot shot. I said, he told us he could get us all this money, and now nothing. So I hung up. And uh, that afternoon, the uh, CFO came to see me, and he said, uh, Joe, uh, Drexel uh, has canceled. They don't want to raise the money for us. I said, well, why? He said, well, because Milken got upset with what you said. I said, Milken, I didn't talk to Milken. I talked to the guy in New York. I said, get him on the phone. Got on the phone, I said, I was told that, that Milken doesn't want to do it now. He said, yes, that's right. I said, why? Well, because of what you said. I said, well, I didn't say that to him. I said it to you. He said, yeah, but I told him. I said, what a dumbass you are. <laughs> so I sat down and wrote an apology letter, and then I sent a pink Jeep to his house for his five-year-old daughter. And finally, he agreed to re-engage, and he did get us the $200 million. So I have to thank him for doing that. So that vehicle that pulled out in front of the hotel, um, when the guy got out, did you or did somebody, or one of the Drexel guys said something like, how do you like your Jeep? And he said, what? It's me. Yeah, yeah, he said, it's was, me. He was so, yeah. assume that he had set this up. <laughs> Well, you just had to know in your heart that the XJ, which was the first compact size SUV, was going against the, you know, the, the Bronco and the Blazer. And they were just two-door models. And the XJ, the Jeep Cherokee, was a four-door. So we just knew that it would be a big hit and it was, you know, nimbler, easier to maneuver, easy to handle. So we thought it was going to be a fantastic car. And we did early research on it, and we got really great, you know, people really loved the concept and so forth. And then about two or three months before the car was going to be introduced, uh, we did a research clinic in Cleveland. And it reminds me, n never go to Cleveland. <laughs> and we had there uh, two early prototypes. And they, and I was there and I watched this whole thing. I, I love going to those research clinics anyway, because you do pick up a lot of great stuff. And the research 
was completed and, and uh, American Motors used a, a company called Oxtaby Smith. And Joe Smith was a little guy and he, he had a fringe, fringe hair around, a bald on top. He wore these round glasses and he was, you know, sh shorter than me and I'm not tall. But he kind of looked like the guy at the gates of heaven, you know, and he that have the books and they say, oh yes, Joe Cappy, well, you were a naughty boy, you know. <laughs> so he said to me, they don't like the car. The people don't like it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a loser. I said, wait a minute, the early research said that they were gonna love it. And now we've got this prototype, it looks terrific, and you're telling me the research is bad. He said, yes. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to launch on time as planned. He says, but what are you going to tell, you know, the, you know, the, the, the CEO? I'm going to tell him that you picked the wrong people to come to this survey. <laughs> It's about how you found out about the impending deal of Chrysler buying AMC from Ben Bidwell and how you were hand delivered and how that delivery was almost botched. <clears throat> well, I had worked for Ben Bidwell at Ford and, uh, and knew him well. And, and all of you who've ever heard him or been close to him, uh, he's got this fantastic wit, dry wit, and. Uh, I knew things were going on from different conversations that I had with, with my people and what they had heard. And so you, you knew something was happening, and, but you just didn't know what, what it was. And you just kind of said, oh, you know what, and, and the people from Renault, especially the guy that I reported to who I had replaced, he would say nothing to me. He would tell me nothing. And so I called Bidwell. And Bidwell became my deep throat. <laughs> he was, he said, Joe, can you come over to my house on Sunday at 11.30? He said, I'm gonna keep a garage door open because I don't want to see your car in front of my house. Anybody see your car in front of my house? Just pull it in the garage and we'll shut the garage door. And I mean, it was that, it was that secret. And then he, uh, his wife Polly served coffee and we sat in the living room and he said, I will tell you everything that's going on. He said, but I want you to know that you can't say anything to anybody, and you have to promise me that. So I did. And then he told me all the things that had been going on, and the work that had been going on for so long with, at, between Chrysler and Renault, and all of the stops and starts and so forth. So it was, it was really very, fortunate that I had him as a source, but I really couldn't tell anybody, you know, in, in, at American Motors because I would break my promise to Bidwell. So it was something that was great. It was kind of like, you know, Churchill, when they broke the German code, they knew where there were the with the radar and the breaking the, the code, they knew where the Germans were gonna bomb, but they couldn't tell the people in that town because then the Germans would know they had broken the code. And so you're, you had this dilemma and there's no good way to handle that when you've got that kind of a situation. You use it to your advantage and you wait till you think it's gonna be really, you know, work out for you. And one thing I, I need to make sure you understand with this book, 
what I tried to do here is to get different viewpoints of what was going on at this time. And for the Chrysler piece, Ralph Cerati and Jim Donlan were major contributors as to what the situation was at Chrysler. Everything from the strategy to the products that were coming and all of that that talks about Chrysler's at strengths and weaknesses at that time came from those two guys. And then I did the same thing with the Renault people and then for, for the American Motors piece, I used different management people that I called to get information and stories from. And, and that's, a, that's a very important thing. And, uh, and I've got to tell you another story about market research. And that was in the book, I tell the story about the ZJ, today's Grand Cherokee. And we had it on the boards as a replacement. But as we started developing that vehicle, it clearly was going to be an additional vehicle and we could take the, the XJ and price position that below and have the ZJ over that. And it was very important and we had the, the vehicle was ready to be launched. However, Chrysler found a, a problem. They had this nest with a bunch of birds that needed worms and they didn't have enough worms. And so a big brouhaha came up as to whether you give money to Dodge to build an SUV or you build the Jeep ZJ. And there was this big meeting that took place with Lee Iacocca and his executive committee. And I had to make a presentation for the ZJ and uh, Ron Bolts had to make a presentation for, for Dodge. And then they, they uh, many of you probably know Dave Boswick. And Dave is the opposite of Joe, uh, Joe Smith. Dave is big, tall, and good looking. But he ended up saying, we shouldn't do an SUV because the minivan market is going to continue to explode and the SUV market is going to shrink. Well, he was wrong on that point. <laughs> Fortunately, Iacocca ended up choosing the ZJ. And as uh, Jason has said, it has saved Chrysler and has, and has saved American Motors. And uh, it's now saving FCA. Yeah. There are certain things that took place that are still going on every day in the business world. And these are mergers and acquisitions. And there's, every time they do, they say, well, there's a gigantic savings. 
Uh, there's going to be synergy, and there's going to be we're going to make save all this money because we're going to do all this consolidation and so forth. The number one important thing is to integrate as quickly as possible. And that was something that Lee Iacocca was very strong about getting done. And Jerry Greenwald uh, asked me to be the integration guy. And what that meant is that you had to go in to American Motors in detail. Every section, every unit, every department, and you had to put a line down as to everything that they did there and the budget that they had for that particular item. Then that had to be taken over to Chrysler and you had to find out where at Chrysler this will be absorbed and have the person in charge of that area agree to take on that responsibility. And that is really a big job. I probably should have done that when I first went into the company. Uh, I would have learned a lot more about American Motors. <laughs> I learned about it, more of it later uh, at that time. But the, the thing was that within the first uh, nine months after we were one company, uh, we had 13 of the departments or units that were at 100% integrated, and there were another four that were at 95%. The only thing that, that took longer, we got everything done within the year, was systems. And systems, you know, that's a two-year deal. I don't care who you have doing it. But uh, that's that's the important thing. That's where you really get benefits. And most of these companies have no idea how they're going to operate, you know, once the merger happens. It's almost like somebody saying uh, George W. Bush shouldn't have invaded Iraq unless he knew how he's going to run it afterwards. And, and that's the thing. We, Everybody thought, you know, they're going to be throwing rose petals and everything will run like it used to. It doesn't happen. And it won't happen between two different companies that have got different cultures, different systems, you know, just a, a completely hard thing to make happen. And I think that's where, where we ended up getting a, a real good head start in the way we did it. Anybody else have a question? All right, give me a second. And Joe, before we get out of here, I want to uh, like to tell the story of 9 11 and how that impacted where you were at the time. And it's a fascinating story that is in the book. Joe, I was in the field when the, the merger took place in the Detroit zone. Uh, it goes without saying that the Eagle uh, never got off the ground. And uh, the, the brand Eagle. Uh, never got off the ground the way it was expected to. Uh, is there something that you would do different that you would recommend that we would have done different? And I guess talk a little bit about how difficult it is to launch a brand new brand in the marketplace. Well, I've got the expert sitting in front of me. Uh, Ralph Cerati was the general manager for, for Eagle. But it was it was the case of that bird nest with too many birds and not enough food. Chrysler couldn't afford to advertise and merchandise the car. And what car did we have? You know, we, we had, we didn't have a full car line. And that was the problem. They didn't want to take uh, a Dodge and make it into an Eagle, didn't want to take a Chrysler and make it into an Eagle, didn't want to take, you know, uh, and, and so, while they didn't do that, guess, guess what they did do? They, they, took an e, they took the Premier and made it into a Dodge. It, you know, now, you know, that didn't make any sense whatsoever. And so the, the Jeep Eagle dealers, they threw their hands up because they know they didn't have the firepower the Dodge dealers had at that time. Uh, 
I don't know that you could have done anything different. Uh, you know, we had a we had two good cars, but we didn't have a full product line or enough of a product line. We, we, we needed at least two more vehicles in order to make Eagle sustain. And then we needed financial support that Chrysler didn't have. And it was destined to be uh, a loser, even though, you know, we wanted it to be a winner. And then it's, it also, on the, uh, the Mitsubishi uh, Eagle Talon was fantastic. But with the Premier, we had the sa same problems. We had all the electrical was done by Renault. And we already had problems with the Renault Fuego and the Renault Alliance, where they had electrical problems that no one could figure out why, but the car would just stop. Ralph took a trip with his family out, out east. It happened to him three times. <laughs> and they towed it into the dealership and they couldn't find out what was wrong. Everything seemed fine. But, you know, we had, we had a problem there. But, uh, you know, I'm sure he has, a lot of times he wakes up at night and is thinking, what could I have done differently? What could we have done? And it's, in the book, I, th I think we say, will the eagle fly? Well, it flew, but it went to Canada or some damn place. <laughs> going to just give you an example of, you know, they're, they're bringing back for, uh, I'm not sure if it's the end of 2017 or beginning of 2018, they're bringing back the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, which is the competitor to the Suburban and so forth. Well, we had that car at American Motors for 30 years, 30 years, and we had no money to put in it to fix problems that were there when the car was first introduced, when it was brand new. And what would happen is the customer would come in to the Jeep dealer and say, you know, I, I think I need to trade. Uh, tell me, uh, does it still have the dust leak in the back window? Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how about that water leak in the front vent window? Yeah, we still got that. <laughs> well, what about around it at the, the back door that you got that air noise? Yeah, yeah, we still got that. <laughs> well, shit, just give me a brown one. <laughs> Just about all of them did. And uh, you know, and if you go out east, you still see these vehicles, uh, you know, they end up bringing them to their hunting camps and all that sort of thing. They, they never die. They never die.
and uh, they're signed, and uh, so they're completely worthless. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to share, kind of end with a story that I found to be one of the most fascinating because I had no idea. You know, when we think about where you were, where we were at 9 11 and the, the catastrophe in New York and Washington and in Pennsylvania, and you think of the industries that were impacted, there was another industry that was impacted that Joe was running. And tell us the story of how, at the rental car um, <coughs> companies, how 9-11 impacted you, what you did to save your company. Well, we were told by uh, Chrysler, uh, Dieter Zetcha wanted to cut back on the number of fleet units that they were selling to Dollar Thrifty. And, you know, we had to replace them with something. So we made an appointment to go see General Motors. And we had an appointment with the, the head of General Motors uh, sales and marketing. And this was at the Wren Center. So uh, myself, uh, the CFO, and uh, the president of Dollar, the president of Thrifty, we flew up in a private plane that we chartered. Usually we travel southwest. And uh, we landed and uh, the next morning we were, went up and had coffee in the concierge area and somebody yelled out and the first plane hit the, the tower and we, we ran in to see what it was, and we watched the second plane hit. Well, our meeting was uh, at, at 9.30, and it was just downstairs and then over to the GM Tower. So we wanted to stay, but we beat it down because we didn't want to pass up the opportunity. And we got ushered into the vice president's office and then we found out that he was on the phone and he looked, uh, he, he looked all just worried. And it turns out that he had two children that, uh, I say children, they were young, young adults uh, working in New York and both working at the trade center, uh, a daughter and a son. And he couldn't reach them by cell phone. Plus, one of the captains of the fire department was his brother. So, you know, he had absolutely, you know, what am I doing with these rent-a-car people? Uh, you know, it was not a good time to, to do anything with them. And so we excused ourselves. We said, we understand the problem. And, and we left. We went across the street to... Uh, I think it was a bar, and we said, well, golly, uh, we're going to have some real repercussions here ourselves. What are we going to do? So we put together a game plan, and the first thing was to, uh, was to send out a message that there would be no price gouging with our customers. Whatever our prices were, they were going to stay that way. And it's a good thing we sent that out because there were people with $100 bills in their hands trying to get cars because they had grounded all air traffic. And unless you were living in the east where you could take a train, there's no way to get home if you didn't have a rental car. And so people that were going to turn in rental cars didn't. People who were trying to get them couldn't get any because nothing was being turned in. And then the people, after the second day, they took off to wherever they lived in the United States. People were driving from New York City to California, wherever. And those cars were dispersed all over the country. And it took literally months to track them all down and get them all back. And that was, uh, that was the case for uh, what I'd say uh, the entire industry. Now, the one thing that we did at Dollar Thrifty was 
we wanted and took action. We realized that the world had changed. You know, you, you may have read that, uh, that fellow's book, uh, Tipping Point, and usually he talks about small things that finally end up and, and you get a, a tipping point. This was a gigantic tipping point. And we knew what was going to happen. So what we did is immediately we, we try, we're going to try to lower our fleet by 20%. We ended up uh, top 45 executives took salary cuts. We laid off 20% of our workforce in the general office. We, we ended up gearing down for what we knew was going to be a long-term situation. And we also then said, but what could we do to motivate our people? Well, we had a, uh, a bonus plan that was up here, and we wanted to lower it. And I went into the board and I said, here's what we want to do to keep our people motivated. And the board didn't want to do it. Because they said, well, we've never, we have never given a target for the next year that's lower than the year before. And this is dramatically lower. And I said, and you've never had the Trade Center demolished either. And air traffic is going to stop. People are, will be afraid to travel. And after a very vigorous discussion and argument, I ended up saying, look, either you're going to approve this or you can fire me or, and, and let me go. But I said, we're going to do this. And they finally agreed. And Dollar Thrifty was the only rental car company that was profitable in the first quarter of the following year and was a leader in uh, return on sales for the whole year. And it's, it's, like, uh, it's like George Patton. You know, he says, a good solution applied with vigor now is better than a perfect solution applied 10 minutes later. And that's the truth. And that's what you've got to recognize, is you can't, you, you can't dilly-dally and uh, think about, well, we can, maybe we can do this better, maybe we can do it cheaper, we can do it. You have to take action. And, and we did. And, uh, and there's never been anything like that. And so you couldn't measure against and say, well, the last time they knocked down the Trade Center, here's what happened, you know. So that was really uh, quite an experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Gatton. And we're excited to be able to buy one from us. We're needy. And again, uh, uh, cash or credit You can take your credit card too, so uh, it's open. It's getting closer to Christmas. It's a great Christmas gift. And it's cleaner than my first book, okay? <laughs>